good to be back here with you. Um, I want to continue in my sermon today. I want to tell you a little bit more about the day that I, we visited the Oropagus on our trip to Greece recently. Um, but it actually starts before we went up on the Rocky Hill. I, I woke up that morning with an email in my inbox uh, that was from a man named Dr. Thomas J. Ord. And it was kind of a personal newsletter from him. If you're not familiar with Dr. Ord, uh, here's his brief bio. Dr. Ord is a professor of theology at Northwind Theological Seminary and former professor of theology and philosophy at Northwest Nazarene University and Eastern Nazarene College. He's published over 30 books, including co-editing with his daughter the book entitled Why the Church of the Nazarene Should Be Fully LGBTQ Plus Affirming. And being from the Boise, Idaho area, he's a good friend of my parents because, you know, that's my neck of the woods. Thomas Ord has been going through for the last couple of years a really difficult experience, which is that he's been charged by the Nazarene church um, for heresy, for teaching that the church should become fully affirming of LGBTQ plus people, and for conduct unbecoming a minister for his actions that he's gone to to try to encourage the church to, to do those things. And the email that I received that morning before we went up on the Oropagus was an email that was about the verdict of his trial, which had taken years. And he said this, the verdict was, I was found guilty for advocating for the full inclusion and full affirmation of queer people and their allies. The punishment, removal of my minister credentials and church membership. I'm now a defrocked and excommunicated heretic. He says, the Board of Discipline got so many things wrong in their decision, but you get a feel for their disdain for me in this paragraph from their verdict. They wrote, our sincere prayer is that Ord will repent of his heretical teachings and devote his considerable talents in a way that he and all those whom he has led astray will find wholeness in Christ. The seriousness of his offenses cannot be overstated. Under the guise of being a Nazarene elder and educator, He has sown deep seeds of confusion and division, leading people away from sound doctrine. Only eternity will show how many souls have been led astray through his false teaching. Yeah. In response to to this statement, Dr. Ord wrote in his email that he was not surprised to lose his credentials. He says, though, I was surprised to be excommunicated and to have my membership removed. I was also surprised at how poorly the verdict was written and the theology in it. I brought, he says, leading theologians as my witnesses, but the discipline board, whose members have a small iota of theological training by comparison, thought they knew better. So we went up on the big rocky hill, and I read the scripture, the sermon that Paul read, and somewhere the general vicinity of where he read it, and then we walked down the big rocky hill, And we went to the ancient city center, the ancient agora of Athens, the birthplace of democracy. And over tucked in the corner of those ruins, there's a fairly small building with what's left now walls that are about this high. And it's the ancient prison of the city. This might be a relatively uninteresting site, except for this prison, they think, was the place where the famous philosopher Socrates was imprisoned when he was on trial, and then eventually was forced to drink hemlock poison for his execution. What's even more interesting, I think, about this is the charges that were given to Socrates, because he was charged by the Athenians with impiety and with corrupting the youth. Do these sound a little bit similar? They're not the same, I'm not comparing them, but they sound a little bit similar. And I think it's even more interesting that they think they know the site of this prison for two reasons. They think, because otherwise it could just be a building. Archaeologists are making all of these um, connections and trying to figure out what things were. But they said within this site, these walls that are this high now, they had these little vials that they said probably were like the vials that contained hemlock poison. And there was also in the courtyard a small bust of Socrates. And they think that this bust of Socrates was placed there a hundred, maybe a couple hundred years after he was executed because the people of Athens realized their mistake. 
I think the church of Nazarene is going to realize their mistake too, right? Like these, I'm not obviously Socrates. I'm not conflating anyone with Socrates, but I was standing there looking at this ancient prison and having read that email and just being like, oh, Something's never changed, I guess. Is this, is this just an ongoing tension in the world? Is this something that we live to deal with? And I found myself asking these questions, two specifically. One, is it possible for us to take two steps forward without taking one back? Right? Which, if you were here for my last sermon, we kind of talked about that a little bit. So I don't want to dive into that too much today. You can find it on YouTube. But the other question I was asking is, when is it that I need to trust myself versus when do I need to turn and trust in someone who knows better than me? That's a hard one. And it even becomes more complicated when we deal with not just trusting in myself, but trusting in like the mass voice, the communal voice, versus trusting in an expert. I, I, I think immediately, immediately I think of Dr. Fauci during COVID, right? Of like how that changed being so significant that how tough it was for, for a lot of people, for many of us, to change our whole lifestyles on one person's advice, but then also realizing, like, oh, man, someone knows better than me on this. This is a tricky tension to hold, especially I recognize the irony of realizing this in the birthplace of democracy in the world. It's a tricky tension to hold. I think I'm, I'm not going to answer anything for you today. I don't have the answers to these questions, but I think we can walk around them a little bit and reflect together. If you look at this initially, you might think that sounds like a bit of a political question or tension to hold, and I think it is. In fact, I think it's interesting that um, a true 100% pure democracy isn't our form of government that we have. We don't vote on every single issue, every single one of us, right? Because we, we surely couldn't have the capacity to do that. But instead, we elect leaders experts, I'll put quotations around that just for, because <laughs> it just doesn't feel right to not do it, but we elect someone to make a lot of our votes for us, right? Because there's something to this tension, even built into our system, we have this tension built between the voice of all of us together being our own government, and sometimes we don't have the capacity to do everything for ourselves, we have to put our trust somewhere else. It's a really tricky thing to navigate. When I think about it personally, it's kind of a test of humility, right? Like, how often am I trusting in myself versus trusting in others? What do I think of myself in comparison to folks? I don't know about you guys, but I find myself going, listening to experts and going, a lot. <laughs> Way too much, probably. Way too much. And it's a tricky one to navigate within myself because I do believe that it's important for me to have the power to do my own research and to learn for myself, to have my own opinions and views, and to do that within a community of people that enforce that and that, that build it together dynamically. And there are some times where there are others I should just be trusting. It's a tough tension to hold because I don't know when to do it. I think it's also a tough tension to hold in faith communities. I had a conversation a few weeks ago um, with someone about the, uh, Luther's perspective of the priesthood of all believers, which was one of his most important takeaways uh, from the Reformation. The, the fact that we don't need a church to stand in between us, to be the intermediary between us and God, that God's grace can come straight to each and every one of us. We don't ha no one gets to safeguard that. And at the same time, we still do need someone to bless our communion, and I still don't want to be expected or charged at any point with doing, answering theological questions for someone who's in their last days. These are things I think should be left to someone who's much more an expert than me. So it's a difficult thing to navigate. How is it all of us, and how do we sometimes need one of us or some of us? It's so tough to sort out this tension. And again, I don't have the answer but I think it's a conversation or a question that's worth circling around. Because it's a, it's a similar, it comes out of this experience of Socrates and Thomas Ord, and at the center of our faith experience actually is a man named Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth who despite being the literal son of God, <laughs> was crucified by the mob. A mob led by religious experts, in fact, who thought they knew better <laughs> than the literal son of God. It's just, it's kind of staring me in the face. 
A couple days before we went to Athens, I found myself lying on a beach um, with my wife, Becky, getting horribly sunburned, horribly sunburned. I mean, the Greek sun, it's, it's different. Um, and we lay in these beach beds with like the awnings over us, but it didn't get this half, so I'm getting just a stripe right down the middle of me turning bright red. And I'm reading a book by Dr. Thomas Ord. It's a book called God Can't. And the book is, is, spends a lot of its time talking about how God isn't a puppet master of us, right? God doesn't control us, but instead that God's relationship with us is more participatory, that God calls us, that God pulls us, that in somewhat Lutheran language, God works in, through, under, with all of us and everything in the world to end suffering, to bring peace, and to call us forward. I thought that was a pretty beautiful piece of this, and, the, and the, I think it speaks to this tension in a way that we realize by ourselves we have tendencies to say the same. This kind of human nature, it's really evolutionary that, that we have survival instincts that tell us trying something we haven't tried before, doing something different, making a transition, thinking a different way, brings risk. And that's not our inherent ability. That's not what we're wired to do. But then God inspires, calls, motivates, pulls, tugs at our heart in order to encourage us down the path towards the ultimate goodness. And I think this often happens through really specific moments, whether it's one event, whether it is a, um, a like, for example, we talked about Fauci, that could happen through, that happened through COVID, but oftentimes this is the role of prophets, right? A specific person who is put into a place to call people forward. This can be people we expect, like pastors. This could be people like politicians, presidents. This could be people like scientists. These are the places we're trained to look for. But these voices that call us, that, are, can, that can deliver this divine message, can also come from places where we are less trained to hear them. Maybe our children, maybe our teenagers. I don't have the answers to how to do this. And I haven't figured out when to do one or the other, but I, I have, I'm working on holding the tension. I'm working on asking the question. I'm working on reflecting um, in humility, hopefully. But I believe it's a tension that, that is good to hold and to wrestle with and to pray about. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us, all of us, as we continue to look for ways that we are being called forward, we are being tugged by the divine spirit to participate in that goodness movement in the world. Amen.